Good afternoon. Happy New Year. This is our first webinar of the new year. Um, and I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker for today, Lisa Thompson, who will be Dr. Lisa Thompson, who will be talking to us about burning plastic waste and climate change. Can implementation science fix this? Um, so Dr. Thompson is a professor in the Nell Hodgson Woodruff School of Nursing um, with a joint appointment in the Gangarosa Department of Environmental Health, Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. The focus of her research is to evaluate effective behavioral change, interventions to reduce maternal and infant exposures to household air pollution from solid cooking fuels. For the past 20 years, she has worked on intervention trials um, pardon me, she has worked on intervention trials related to household air pollution, including the first randomized stove intervention study on infant pneumonia in Guatemala, the RESPIRE trial, and the Household Air Pollution Intervention Network, HAPPEN, stove intervention trial. She is the principal investigator of a, clu a cluster randomized trial in rural Guatemala, the Ecolectivos, an implementation science study to develop and evaluate community level interventions that aim to reduce household burning of plastic waste. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Thompson. And as she, um, if, what you can do during her talk, we'll have save a little time for Q and A. So if you have any questions, um, you can put those in the Q&A section of Zoom. Dr. Thompson. All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. You can hear me okay and see my slides, I, I think, okay? Yeah. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to come here and speak with you today. Um, I have kind of four areas I'll be talking about, climate change, plastic waste, how the two relate to one another, a little bit about implementation science, and then the application of these three um, in our Ecolectivo study in rural Guatemala. Um, obviously, the, each of these areas would take hours to elaborate upon, and I only have about 40 to 45 minutes, so um, I'm going to uh, move pretty fast through each of these and touch upon them uh, rather lightly. So the first is climate change. I think we're all aware of that since this is kind of the focus of this group um, that um, the sixth IPCC report was released in 2023 and concluded that we um, have seen a human induced global warming about two degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and this has changed the earth's climate in unprecedented ways, including um, the highest concentrations of CO2 seen in 2 million years, uh, Arctic and glacier ice melting and warmer seas that are rising. So um, this is principally due to greenhouse gases that humans emit. Um, we have slowered our emissions in, over time, um, but even if countries met their climate pledges um, at, that they made at the IPCC, um, the greenhouse gas emissions would only be reduced by 7% from 2019 levels by 2030. And we need to see a 43% reduction to limit temperature to 1.5 degrees. So we obviously have a lot of work to do in a short amount of time, and we need to radically increase both our ambition and, back and action on, on this front. So what's the number one thing we need to do in order to achieve this? Um, Ambitious goal, uh, we need to stop burning fossil fuel. That's the number one cause of the climate crisis. And this is obviously um, easier said than done. Um, and uh, I, this graph here um, really demonstrates the kind of what we think about our carbon budget. Um, if we, um, to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we can spend about, uh, 510 gigatons, uh, 510, um, uh, million gigatons of um, carbon dioxide 
uh, to reach this net zero by um, 2050, uh, 2050, oh, God, 5050, no, 2050. Um, but um, with all the plans of, for existing fossil fuel infrastructure, we're looking at about 850 gigatons of carbon dioxide that will be emitted. So we're in the red in terms of our budget on carbon emissions. So COP28 uh, recently ended in Dubai, and um, I'd say that there were some achievements and some uh, lack of achievements. Um, the first COP was held in Berlin, Germany in 1995. So imagine the progress that could have been made if we'd taken action then. But after decades of um, kind of evading the, the real culprit, which is fossil fuel, um, it has been acknowledged um, and, and long overdue that we need to move away from coal, oil, and gas. Uh, but there are many loopholes and uh, wording was debated, uh, including the term transition away instead of phase out and wealthy nations, uh, including the United States, will continue to expand fossil fuel exploration. And this leaves countries in developing regions of the world that are reliant on fossil fuel and are the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change um, to find uh, ways to survive and uh, without the ability to really put money behind the support for transition to renewable energy on a global scale. I only have one slide on climate change and impacts on human health because I think you're all aware of that. Uh, given the, the topic of this webinar. Um, but I do like this um, slide because I think it offers a conceptual diagram that shows the exposure pathways by which climate drivers impact health outcomes. So the, um, the exposure pathways in blue and the health outcomes in uh, purple. And then the gray boxes on either side show the kind of um, what positively or negatively influences exposure pathways. So vulnerabilities for individuals are shown on the right box and vulnerabilities at larger scale um, are shown in the left box. Okay, now I'd like to move on to the plastic, which is really the, my, my topic of interest. Um, so uh, actually I'm gonna hope that this works. I'm gonna show you a little video and um, some of you may know what's coming in this one minute clip. Uh, I hope you brought your popcorn, and um, here we go. I mean, with your future. You're lying. Well, that's a little hard to say. Ben. Excuse me. Mr. McGuire. Ben. Mr. McGuire. Come with me for a minute. I want to talk to you. Excuse me, Joanne. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. I just want to say one word. Just one word. Yes, sir. I'm going to see you. Yes, sir. The plastics. Exactly how do you move? There's a great future in plastics. Think about it. What do you think about it? Yes, sir. Word. I'm sad. That's a deal. Money is wrong. If we only knew then what we know now. Uh, to make another historical point, um, this is an article that was uh, in uh, Lancet Planetary Health by one of our co-investigators, Dr. Margaret Hanley from UCSF. And this was a commentary um, where uh, she mentioned a book called Pollutionist Colonialism by Dr. Max uh, Lieberon, who is a Canadian researcher. Um, who is um, really fantastic. I would urge you to uh, look them up and their, the work they're doing. They've uh, even started a, a degree in looking at waste disposal and um, where, where, where waste ends up. And um, uh, they bring attention to the, a moment in 1956 prior to the graduate when an editor of Modern Packaging said, the future of plastics is in the trash can. It's time to stop thinking about reuse packages and concentrate on single use. And this prediction is borne out by data that we have today, that plastic production has increased from two to 390 million metric tons uh, in, during this uh, past period of time. So we produce a lot of plastic, but how do we manage plastic waste? The orange represents the mismanaged and uncollected uh, 
plastic. And you can see that most of the mismanagement occurs in low or middle income regions that may not have the infrastructure or the resources to deal with the mounting plastic waste problem. On the other side of the bar in the circle is the amount of plastic that is uh, recycled. And this is uh, from 2019. So globally, only 9% of plastic waste is recycled while 22% is mismanaged. And as a, as a result of this, an estimated 8 million metric tons of this plastic waste enters into the world's oceans each year. And, and, and so it's quite a problem, not only for our, our land system, but for our um, um, oceans. So where will we be in the future? This is actually a new project uh, publication. They have a great website um, out of Berkeley um, where they've actually stacked all the plastic and said that by uh, 2050, 2050, if we continue business as usual, we will have generated 3.2 billion tons of plastic waste. And um, you can see there um, how it represents um, on top of the island of Manhattan. So uh, obviously this is something that needs a policy to um, across the globe to address this problem. So um, we need to take action. And we actually have several very encouraging movements that are addressing plastic. First of all, just to give you an idea that if we had a mandate to build new plastic products using at least 30% recycled plastic instead of virgin plastic, it would cut plastic pollution by 29%. And if we limited non-essential plastic production, we would see a similar 26% decline in plastic pollution. So you can think of non-essential plastic production basically as packaging. There is an organization called the Global Plastic Action Partnership, um, which is a public-private partnership, which includes Nestle, which is one of the biggest um, emitters of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So it's not exactly a, uh, innocent, but it is working with um, public institutions to form uh, a science-based roadmap to accelerate the transition to circular economies, mostly in the global South. The truly exciting news is the UN Environmental Programs Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee, the INC, which has convened two meetings and is set to convene two meetings more to create an international legally binding global treaty on plastic pollution. Um, this is similar and has been compared to the Paris Agreement of 2015 for climate change. So of course this treaty, just like we know for um, the IPCC and everything that's gone on with the COP uh, meetings uh, requires lengthy discussions um, with each country to enforce locally and to change laws in 193 states uh, would be a huge deal. Currently, I think there's 175 countries participating in this. Um, next year's meeting will be in April 2024 in Canada, which um, off topic has quite a considerable problem with plastic, um, both creating plastic and also accepting importing plastic waste. So what do these two things have in common? What does climate change and plastic waste have to do with one another? Well, first of all, plastic is made of petroleum. So four to 8% of global, global um, oil consumption is associated with plastics. Plastics are produced from natural gas, feedstocks derived from natural gas processing, crude oil refining. Um, so if this reliance on plastic production persists, Plastics will actually account for 20% of oil consumption by 2050. And I think this is the shift we're seeing in terms of petrochemical countries, I mean, petrochemical um, industries that are producing what uh, they call ethane cracker plants near the refineries to actually make the building blocks for plastic. Um, and these fossil fuel industries are actually gaining, um, you know, of course, it's a, a process of uh, creating um, capital for them. And this, this, these ethane cracker plants produce a whole host of hazardous air pollutants. So um, this, this production leads to large emissions of CO2 when it's expected to increase by 34% in the 2030. Of course, incineration of plastic waste also um, increases greenhouse gases 
um, at a rate of four, um, estimated to be at a rate of 49 million metric tons by 2030. And um, we also know that in um, the oceans, these plastics tend to accumulate the uh, nano particles and the micro particles of plastic. And there's even been a suggestion that these plastics can interrupt the cycles that are um, essential to maintaining the ocean's role as a carbon sink. So there's a lot of problems with plastic. And there's even more that I could go on and on about. And I just, as I said, do not have the time to do that here. But um, there are 13,000 chemicals that have been identified in plastic. And plastics are made of so many different types of polymers. Um, there's uh, different types of plastics. We know that when we flip it over and we see the triangle with the different numbers on them. Um, and some are recyclable more than others. Colored plastic is less recyclable than the clear or the white plastic. And I ask myself um, when I buy cleaning chemicals and see the white plastic with a plastic sheath on top that identifies what's inside the bottle um, and actually removing that plastic sheath then allows that white plastic bottle to be recyclable. Um, so at first I thought, oh God, plastic on top of plastic. And then I learned that that's one way to make that bottle more recyclable, remove the plastic sheet and recycle the white plastic. So there's these three, the, the numbers three to seven on the triangle on the bottle, those are called mixed plastics. And those are everything from takeout ca uh, containers to vinyl siding. They're made from several types of polymers. They have a diversity of chemical additives. And this brings a staggering range of melting points, toxicity, other chemical properties that make recycling difficult and expensive. So um, just to refresh people's memory, if you don't know, or um, enlighten you if you do, China was once the, once the main export um, destination for much of the world's plastic scrap. Uh, but in 2018, China introduced a ban because many of the materials they were receiving were contaminated with other types of materials and weren't easily recyclable. Uh, in 2019, the US sign, did not sign the, the, Basel, the Basel Convention, but other countries did. Uh, but there are new international rules that have uh, continued um, to uh, try to rein in the export of plastic waste into poor countries. Um, but the U.S. has not signed that Basel Convention, and so it isn't bound by these new inter international rules. In fact, um, if you uh, look on the web, you'll see that there's quite a lot of, of, of import and export uh, across the border between uh, United States and Canada that's um, actually not exactly above board or legal since Canada signed the Basel Convention and will also host the International Negotiating Committee on the Plastic uh, Treaty, INC4, in 2024. So um, this kind of transparency and how plastic waste is exported and imported, it's very hard to track and to really understand where our plastic ends up. But um, unfortunately, a lot of this ends up in the global south um, because the in importing countries such as Indonesia um, will receive these plastics to try to recycle them, but much of it unfortunately ends up in the oceans. So when we look at articles that talk about the polluting countries that have large shorelines like Indonesia, um, what we really don't understand is the fact that why and how they're polluting is not from what they are consuming, but what they are importing from other high consumer countries like the United States. Um, and so this has been known, uh, kind of, uh, this uh, term has been coined as waste colonialism. I also want to point out that um, many of these uh, plastics are really hard to kind of characterize, but they have been called CMR or carcinogenic, mutagenic, or, or causing reproductive harm. As we know, they're environmentally persistent. We won't be able to recycle the problem away with only 9% uh, being recycled currently. Um, one thing that's quite important and I touched on in, in terms of Indonesia is this um, plastic that's being imported into low resource countries or even the plastic that's produced and used in low resource countries is a source of income for waste pickers. There's quite a lot of uh, documentation in the scientific literature of what waste pickers are exposed to when they recycle this plastic. Uh, but uh, there really isn't um, an easy way to recycle the problem away. 
And again, we can't, sh we shouldn't ship it offshore. That uh, contributes to waste colonialism. And then the plastics degrade into micro and nanoplastics, which harm the environment and humans that consume the fishes in the oceans. So I really wanted to point out that um, what I'm gonna be talking about in a few minutes is really um, burning plastic waste and the health effects of that. So um, this really sh it illustrates that open burning of plastic in low resource countries can uh, incur it, you know, plastics reprocessing, e-waste recovery sites, construction sites and hospitals, but mostly I'm gonna be talking about household open burning. And these emissions, which are challenging to characterize because they're so complex, can either be inhaled by populations or they can deposit through rain into our groundwater and be uh, consumed through drinking water or deposit on crops and be consumed through eating the foods. So the problem globally is that 2 billion people do not have solid waste collection services. So um, they actually are left with nothing to do but uh, burn their plastic or solid waste, bury it, or dump it in, uh, in areas that sometimes are clandestine. And it's been estimated that uh, uh, over a quarter million people die prematurely every year from uh, open burning of waste. And by this, I'm not really talking about incineration, in large facilities, I'm talking about this widespread practice of open burning of waste in households, in neighborhoods, and even um, I've seen in clinics and hospitals outside the hospitals, kind of these burn piles with uh, medical waste in them. So there are health concerns. They depend on the type of plastic being burned and they're hard to characterize. We've mostly seen a lot of animal studies that have looked at concerns about specific plastics. But again, as I said, they are called CMR, um, and it's really what's in the plastic. Uh, in our study, we're looking at phthalates and bisphenols um, and heavy metals, and um, the phthalates are the plasticizers that make plastic more durable. They've been found to disrupt the endocrine system in humans. Bisphenols are a broad class of chemical compounds that also disrupt the endocrine system. Heavy metals found in plastic are carcinogenic, such as arsenic and antimony. And the dioxins from burning plastic um, have been uh, linked pretty definitively to cancer and also endocrine disruption and neurotoxic effects. So now I'm gonna move on to implementation science as my third kind of big bucket. And then I'll talk about ecolectivos and how these all three come together. So how do we define implementation science? This is the scientific study of strategies to promote the uptake of evidence-based practices into routine practice and hence to improve the quality and effectiveness of human health. So we're really looking at uptake. Unlike clinical trials, which are trying to isolate a treatment effect, an implementation research study wants to arrive at the best strategy by the end of the study. So implementation science wants to identify uptake that are either barriers or facilitators within a specific context for which context is very important. And implementation science wants to develop implementation strategies that overcome these barriers and increase uptake. So as I'm going through this, you might think about, okay, what are we gonna do with plastic and low resource countries in, in, these, in, this, in, the, with, in these kinds of um, strategies or ideas that implementation science wants uh, uh, our, our researchers to think about. So unlike clinical trials, implementation research studies aim to arrive at the best strategy by the end of the study. Okay, we don't go in with our, this is our intervention and now we're gonna look at health outcomes. We do come in with a sense of what our intervention is, but we may um, along the way figure out what is the best implementation strategy um, within that intervention uh, to actually affect um, the outcomes. So our question as implementation scientists is how do we get people to do something in the real world after dealing with barriers and enablers that people face? So this is a kind of a pipeline of the study spectrum. Um, and uh, we start off with um, preclinical research and then move into efficacy studies or RCTs. Efficacy studies focus on if an intervention works under ideal or highly controlled conditions. 
um, and that's to um, to really um, really understand that the efficacy of the specific treatment on a given outcome. Effectiveness trials um, allow for a little bit more uh, real world scenario. And so they want to focus on whether an intervention works, say, in a clinical setting, given the complexities of clinics, and allows a little bit more, um, a less controlled environment. And implementation research focuses on how an intervention works in a real world setting. This is a really great slide. I urge you to read um, this um, implementation science made too simple, a teaching tool. It's one slide that Dr. Curran uses, and I've kind of adapted it here to really look at what is it talking about? What are we talking about when we talk about implementation science? Implementation science is not quality improvement in hospitals. Implementation science is actually a bit more complex than that because it's looking at a kind of a wider spectrum than one hospital and one thing in one environment. So um, in order to understand implementation science, we have an intervention or a practice or an innovation. That's the thing. So what thing are we, are, are we doing? And then our effectiveness research is looking at whether that thing works. Did it work in that given context? And our implementation research is looking at how best to help people to do that thing. Okay, so one step away from effectiveness research, we're looking at how best to help people do this thing. And for that, we have implementation strategies. And those are the stuff that we do to help people do this thing. So if you look at clinic-based strategies, that might be um, educational strategies, incentives, restructuring an environment, doing things to help people get them to do this thing. And then um, the main implementation outcomes are how much and how well do people do this thing? So for that, we need to understand the reach, the adoption, the sustainability of that thing. So in the case of our study that I'll explain shortly, the thing that we want people to do in our study is to stop burning plastic in their household fires, okay? And our implementation strategy is what we call a dynamic working group, which is really kind of an educational intervention. So there are key ingredients for complex interventions, such as what we're doing. And uh, these are a couple of references here below. Inter um, implementation science is guided by theories, models, and frameworks. Uh, you do best to have an interdisciplinary team. Um, that's one of the key elements because you need so many perspectives to do a good job. You have to involve stakeholders or communities in your engagement if you want them want people to do the stuff that you want them to do. Uh, they need to also want to do it. So you need to involve them, make sure you're you're in touch with those need, you know, those needs and desires. You need to understand the context or the real world um, assessment in which you're working. Uh, this intervention that you have, your implementation strategies, the things that you want people to do need to be standardized. There needs to be integrity to this intervention. Um, you can't kind of vary it wildly or you won't know which are the key elements that make something work. And then you need to have a process evaluation or some kind of, of, of supportive feedback me mechanism at the end. So now I'm gonna switch uh, to my last and final um, area, which is probably the part I love the most, which is the Ecolectivo study in rural Guatemala. And um, as was uh, discussed in the Introduction, this is, I've worked in uh, Guatemala on research studies for the past 20 years. I've mostly looked at household air pollution intervention studies. And um, as a result of this work, I've focused now on looking at plastic waste burning. Why? Um, well, uh, globally ambient or outdoor and, and indoor household air pollution represents the single largest environmental risk factor for ill health. But the contribution of waste burning, specifically open burning of plastic waste, has not been evaluated sufficiently. I already said that 2 billion people lack solid waste collection services, which leads them to burn their waste. Um, some studies have looked at pollutants released from the burning of mixed solid waste, but there's a lack of studies looking at specific plastic burning and household fires. So a lot of these studies have kind of looked at 
garbage piles by the side of the road and emission studies to see what's what's being burnt. Um, but here we're actually looking at a specific, um, trying to characterize this plastic. So we've, we've had decades of clean cook stove programs that have looked at the consequences of household air pollution from solid fuel burning in low resource communities, but they've uh, pretty much not looked at plastic waste burning as part of that. Um, so uh, you can see here on the left, uh, the picture of a fire, an open fire and food being cooked indoors, uh, ambient uh, characterization of air pollution, smog as we know it. Um, and then the, the panel in the middle shows the RESPIRE trial, which was a chimney stove intervention where we provided solid fuel stoves to households um, and then compared them to people who continue to use open fires it was a study done two decades ago. Um, and so this was actually a seminal study, a first randomized control trial of a stove. And it was followed up um, several decades later with the, later with the Happen trial, which was um, a gas stove trial and it provided free fuel and a gas stove to households in four countries. Guatemala, India, Rwanda, and Peru. This is a large study of over 3,200 households. Um, and uh, I was involved in the Guatemala site. So pictured there is the stove that we provided to the Guatemalan households and the gas tank is outside. Um, so you can see the yellow hose that connects to a gas tank outside. Um, and uh, during these, the course of these two studies, what we saw and what I saw was basically people burning things like Crocs uh, Coke bottles um, in their outdoor fires. And in the lower uh, panel, you can see actually something blue and green. Those are, that's Tupperware and green plastic bags burning in the indoor fires. So why is this an equity problem? Uh, plastic is, as I already said, um, derived from petrochemicals. It's uh, single use plastic is growing exponentially. Here you can see in the rural dump, all those colorful pieces of single use plastic. Um, it's a global problem um, and it's based on appropriate waste management. This is a dump in Jalapa where we're working. Um, you can kind of see in the teeny tiny back underneath the trees that it's burning. This, this dump does catch on fire and uh, you can smell it in the city. It smells terrible. Uh, in fact, when you're walking by households, you can smell plastic burning inside their house. It has a, a distinct smell. Um, and these plastics produce uh, so many toxic chemicals um, that have uh, that we're trying to characterize um, as we can. And um, in the area where we're working, this is a rural poor area. Um, it's indigenous um, and these communities have been marginalized and discriminated against um, for centuries. So the overview of our study, um, we are a study um, that is evaluating implementation strategies to reduce household level plastic burning in rural Guatemalan indigenous Xinca communities. And we're uh, aiming to advance the adoption, implementation and sustainability of community driven actions and to develop an approach for policy relevant solutions that manage this um, plastic. And we also hope in the long run to address environmental and health equity. This is a complex slide, but it basically shows um, kind of everything we hope to do within this study. So for this talk, I'm focusing on the purple side of the graph. That's our aim one, which is to implement dynamic working groups in eight intervention villages. Um, and we're comparing um, uh, these women that are enrolled in these villages, 400 of them, uh, to um, actually 200 of them are drawn from, uh, from a uh, work are uh, working in our aim to uh, which is to actually look at characterize their um, urinary biomarkers and uh, air pollution personal air pollution exposures to 200 women in control groups so it says 50 persons in each village is because we're inviting um, the women from aim two in our biomarker study and additional women from the community to participate in these working groups for a total of 400 women uh, and uh, below is kind of a schema, which I will go over, which is kind of like what our intervention looks like. And I'll get more into that later. Uh, and then aim two, as I said, is to enroll 400 women and uh, characterize their exposure to personal air pollutants, um, particulate matter, uh, 
and uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, black carbon, and then we're looking at urinary biomarkers, phthalates, bisphenols, um, and other exposures. And then um, AIM-3 is a modeling uh, exercise. My, my co-PI, Dr. Eric Saikawa from Emory University, uh, will be modeling emissions from plastic burning on a re and, and a set and modeling them on a regional scale by looking at some of the filter based tracers of plastic burning that women are wearing to estimate the emissions from plastic uh, that we're uh, seeing in this in this study. So let me focus on specific aim one. Using dynamic working groups, we're implementing and evaluating these strategies. We are using Mickey's behavior change wheel framework uh, to guide our uh, intervention. And then we're using Glasgow's re-aim framework to evaluate the fidelity reach and potential for scale up. And I'll talk about those separately. This is a picture here of our recyclers from one of our communities, which is one of our intervention strategies or implementation strategies, excuse me. So the behavior change wheel is actually um, something that is uh, I don't a, a very fun, a usable framework for actually looking at capabilities, opportunities, and motivations that you can see in the green ring to change behavior. So understanding these uh, help us to understand um, the kind of complexities of things that we need to um, identify and, and work with. And then some of the outer rings are the things that have to do with what we can do with that once we know. So what are the kind of intervention functions like education, persuasion, training that we might take on? So here's an example of some uh, capabilities, motivations, and opportunities that we're uh, working with to change behavior. So in order to get people to stop plastic burning, we need to understand things like their capabilities can they identify recyclable plastics? Do they know where plastic goes? What do they think about not burning um, plastic trash? How would that affect their health and their environment? We need to understand motivation. So are family members enthusiastic about burning plastic? Are people on board with this? Um, what do family members think? Is it a priority for the household? And then opportunities are focusing on community resources that are available for recycling, um, uh, other things that people can do in their environment to reduce plastic burning. So this is an example of putting the uh, Mickey's combi into a framework that we can use. And we use this to guide our questionnaires and we use this to guide our intervention. We're also using Glasgow's re-aim evaluation framework to understand what happens. How many women do we reach? Um, how many people come to the working groups? What behaviors do they adopt? Uh, and uh, so there's a little bit more complex than I really want to go into, but I wanted to give you a kind of a flavor of how we're uh, looking at this over the long run to evaluate our study. So I said we need an interdisciplinary team. We have implementation scientists. We have a Guatemalan medical anthropologist. We have an atmospheric chem chemist, environmental epidemiologist, et cetera, et cetera. We have a very large team of people, both um, in the United States and in Guatemala who are working with us. Let me talk about our formative phase briefly. Um, first of all, I said we're in um, indigenous communities in the, in the mountain of Xalapam. And uh, for that, we need to work with regional and municipal officials and relevant ministries. We've identified village champions and our field workers actually come from these communities. And we've worked in these communities in the HAPN trial for the past, uh, since 2016. So they kind of know of us and that kind of uh, allowed us more entry into the into this mountain, which has been traditionally kind of closed off to, especially to mining. Um, they're very anti-mining. And so they're, they are very autonomous. And so we've had to spend a lot of time and we do spend a lot of time working with communities to help, you know, to, to, to get their permission to do the study. So they gave us permission and we um, conducted a baseline assessment in households in 37 villages on the mountain. And that was to really understand kind of what's currently being done with waste practices and to understand their capabilities, opportunities and motivations to change behaviors that reduce plastic waste burning. And to uh, allow us to really have an, an integrity, to, to create an inter intervention that was standardized and had integrity, 
um, our Guatemalan medical anthropologist picture here, Dr. Mayardi Hangstroman, conducted many participant observations, open-ended surveys, key informant interviews, and actually conducted a pilot of our intervention uh, and with modifications. One thing she observed that probably we wouldn't have observed something kind of small but significant, um, along with a lot of pictures of plastic trash along the side of the road and burn piles, as you can see here and on the left, it, it is in the right on this household fire, little tiny pieces of plastic. People burn these plastic, but they do not see these scraps as actually plastic burning. While they're cooking, they just toss things into the fire. And so um, this was one key, you know, if you ask people, do you burn plastic in your household fire? No, but actually um, these pictures reveal that they do. They just don't consider it to be plastic as they see it. Um, as I said, uh, the pilot was, um, we, we piloted the intervention, which is a 12 week working group curriculum in one village in preparation for the main trial. So let me talk about the main trial. This little colorful blob is actually the mountain of Santa Maria Chalapan, and it shows all the different sectors or villages that we're working in, and they're color-coded. Um, we selected 16 villages out of 37, and then uh, they're, you can see here they're paired up um, based on uh, house uh, community size and proximity to the road. So let me just go back and just discuss again what we do with um, our villages uh, as we move through. We got permission from the village leaders and um, kind of the, at the, the, the top of the hierarchy. And now what we do is when we go into each pair of the villages, um, we present our study to the local leaders. On the left is Wagner, one of our field workers. Um, once they give us permission, we do a baseline assessment at the household level of 50 households, 25 in intervention, 25 in um, control uh, to, to, to actually kind of collect data on them, including their biomarker data. Um, and then, and third step is to do a community diagnosis, which is with our field workers here. You can see Francisco working with one of our one of the village leaders to understand about the community. What are the current practices? Do they have waste pickup? Do they have recycling? Um, are, are they, you know, how would they want to interface with our, with ecolectivos? Um, and that includes presentations. Um, and finally, when we pull everyone, uh, when we're ready to actually randomize the households, we pull everyone back together again to explain the process of randomization and what that means. And then um, the, here you can see below, they pick, a, pick cards and one village is assigned to intervention and the other to control. So let me talk a little bit about our intervention briefly. We have a, a, we have a field guide where we, uh, each of the modules is discussed. Here you can see one of our classes where they're working on composting. This is a kind of a scenario of what we do. Um, we do have, Kind of didactics about you know uh, air pollution exposures and things like that, but most of our classes uh, that first eight weeks are very interactive. So we uh, talk about sorting and we actually sort recyclable materials. Um, we do community composting because people were burying their plastic with things that were organic. Um, we make soap because people were talking about plastic packaging that they wanted to avoid. The final uh, month, weeks nine to 12, is where each village selects an intervention based on what they want to do. And that is carried out for the following nine months. So here's some examples of class reflections. Um, what are the reasons why there's a lot of plastic garbage in the community? These are all interactive, people answer. Our field workers are excellent at getting very shy women because they are mostly women that attend the groups. Um, to answer these questions, but they're getting quite interactive. Um, as I said, activities are interactive. Here are women making botanical soap. Here are women composting, uh, along with uh, one of our uh, Ministry of Agricultural participant um, uh, officials who's there to kind of help along with the composting. But now we do that uh, kind of independently. And then, um, as I said, over the next nine months, people, each village can select a different uh, kind of activity or intervention. And so this one community in our, in our pilot selected to be recyclers. Um, and so we, we identified the recyclers, they were trained, we created signage to hang in their stores. 
uh, these women that explained the recycling program to their neighbors, and then they set up recycling bins that then a central recycler came up to buy the materials. So women made money buying uh, rec recyclables, and then um, they sold it to the recycler. So it's a little bit of income generation for the participants. Um, one thing that we found in terms of uh, increasing the implementation of the kind of the nine month period when uh, women were, or villages were participating in a community cleanup, that was one of our interventions. Uh, worm composting was another one. And uh, what we found was that uh, having our field workers visiting these communities was really labor intensive and probably something that we could uh, actually have a better outcome if we designated some of the participants of our intervention groups uh, as community health promoters. And so in each village, uh, one to three are selected to be promoters in intervention villages. And this is one here on the right who has uh, taken up worm composting. And uh, these women travel to the 25 women who are in the biomarker study in each intervention village every month to talk with them about their participation, Ecolectivo's activities to encourage them to participate and to ask them about whether or not they're burning plastic. So you could think of this as kind of an extension of our project. And actually we um, th hope that this will become something that becomes sustainable when our, our project ends. So one thing I just want to talk about really uh, briefly before I end is that when we went to the village elders, uh, the, the village leaders um, to talk about our study uh, and we talked about randomization, they said, well, what about these control villages? You know, what are they getting for it out of it? Why should they participate? That's a completely logical question, um, should be asked of anybody. And um, they liked the idea that we would provide a little trees for a reforestation project for the control participants. So what we are doing and um, working with local um, ag companies and with a local cooperative extension of the university is to provide small saplings to the control villages and to the participants in the control villages. So we provide, I think, 25 to 50 little saplings to each household, which they can do with as they please. So some of them put the trees in, um, in their lands because these are farming communities, mostly coffee um, and, and, and corn. And then um, they can also plant them in their household. And then to the villages, we give them uh, 200 saplings, which they can plant as they as they choose. Um, so we've had them um, planted near water sources um, on hillsides. And here you can see our both our field workers and the community members provide this. They bring their tools, their people come with their uh, shovels and hoes and plant together. So it's a nice way of kind of providing control villages with the compensation. In year five, um, and I think is close to the last slide that I have here is, um, and we hope we get to year five because with delays, we're currently enrolling. Um, we will get to year five, but where we'll be at that stage is kind of uh, hopefully we'll be on target. We're currently enrolling the fifth pair of communities out of eight. And so we follow them for a year in year three currently. We want to disseminate the results and we got a little um, supplement to our grant to disseminate the results to the participating control communities using community fairs. So our intervention uh, participants will go to con the control villages and say, hey, this is what I did. We compost it, here's how you can do it. We, uh, we created uh, organic soap, here's how you can do it. So we have a lot of educational materials and support and actually some money to support control villages who want to take on um, what the intervention villages have successfully done. So I want to thank everybody. Um, There's really a lot of great people working on this trial um, and it's funded by NIHS. It's um, one of our, one of the first implementation science uh, R01s that's been funded by NIHS. I think I was the first, but um, and there's we ha do have a website, ecolectivosguatemala.org. You can look more at our study and all the aspects of it. Um, here are some of our field team members in, in Guatemala. They're incredible, um, and we couldn't do it without them. 
Some final thoughts is just that implementation research is messy because context is complex. At every turn, we're challenged um, from whether the local recycler wants to continue to work with us. That was the conversation as of yesterday um, to uh, how are our health promoters actually uh, getting to households to, to interview our participants. Um, we need to maintain standardization while at the same time being somewhat flexible and we need to understand what are the key ingredients of, of the intervention. So my final question is, can implementation science fix a global plastic waste problem and its influences on global climate change? That was the topic of my talk. I'd say um, at this point, I can't answer that question because we're still kind of in the thick of it, but this is one study that we hope that at least locally will influence a, a plastic waste problem and hopefully will be something that we can scale up uh, this is a picture of one of our participants from our pilot study who said to us, um, why can't we go back to the old ways, the way we used to um, do things? And she brought her ceramic mug and, and bowl with us, says this is what we used to eat off of. And now we just eat off of plastic because it's cheaper. But thank you very much. Here's an example of plastic containers used uh, for flowers and pots. We have all kinds of pictures of the alternatives to to using plastic, but I thought this one was quite pretty. So now I'm going to exit. Thank you. And I am going to stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. That was that was really an incredible, um, incredible. You packed a lot of information into that. Um, it's an incredible example of interdisciplinary research. Um, your you gave a wonderful, informative overview of the plastics problem of implementation science. What you're doing is innovative, um, and you're you know including the community. There are so many elements that are just really impressive. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Um, we have some questions in the chat, and I I I really like the picture of the woman with the ceramic bowl and mug because I think we all need to get back to the way we used to do things, for yeah. sure. Um, we have some questions in the chat. I was just gonna say on that, just to like uh, kind of put a comparison of point into like what we do here in the US with hospitals. I, I gave a similar talk at a at Sigma Theta Tau Nursing Society conference and uh, somebody, or actually the president of Sigma brought up, uh, you know, why, why, don't, why aren't we using autoclaves anymore? You remember, and I remember when I was a volunteer before I became a nurse, trucking uh, metal instruments down to the basement, to the autoclave and picking up autoclaved instruments and taking them back up to the emergency room. And now we just have these prepackaged pla plastic trays with plastic instruments. And we might use one thing off the tray and throw the rest away. So there are old ways in hospitals that we might think about going back to too. So I just wanted to bring that up for those of you who work in the healthcare sector here in the US. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I did, I spent some years in Rwanda doing um, surgical trips to do cardiac surgery and they taught us a lot about, you know, they had us reflect on our waste and, you know, they're much better at, although they're they're coming becoming more westernized in that front, but definitely um, more responsible with their their waste, their hospital waste. So we have a question in the chat. Um, what kind of alternatives exist for disposing of plastic waste besides recycling and incinerating to actually get rid of the plastic instead of shipping offshore or letting it degrade in the environment? It's a big question. Oh, it's a big question. Um, <laughs> I would say that one thing people are looking at is this idea of a circular economy. I mean, we just have to get to that point. We have to get to the point where whatever we use can then make its way back into being reused. And so I think that's the, the problem with plastic is that it's not circular at all. Um, it is used once and thrown away. So part of part of the problem is, you know, can we get to a circular economy? And the second one is, um, you know, can we stop using all this useless plastic? That's just, I mean, it's so hard to go into, I go into a grocery store and challenge myself to pick out something that's not plastic. Um, and it's it's impossible, you know, including just choosing which pasta I'm gonna buy. It's all wrapped in plastic now. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I think that 
you know, incineration uh, was something, China is one of the largest incinerator countries, you know, incineration, if it were completely, completely incinerated to the point where it would be, you know, the only thing coming out of the stack would be water and CO2 um, if it were 100% combusted. Um, but it never is 100% combusted. So there's always dirty stuff coming out of the stacks. Um, and, and and at any rate, it's still CO2 coming out of the stacks and that's a greenhouse gas. So incineration is probably not the answer, but um, you know that's something that's, that's uh, harder to come by. So I think people are looking at um, you know, it's, I guess I'm thinking very locally now on what people can do to stop using plastic. And most of it is to stop it, you know, uh, just don't, don't pick up that plastic bag because, you know, I, I like, I'm pretty active when I go into stores and somebody gives me something and they, they're right away bagging it. You know, I'm like, don't eat it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, but it's a, it's a challenge. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's a question that you mentioned doing urine screening. Are you looking for microplastics or biomarkers on anything else, such as stool, breast milk? No, we don't have the funding um, to look at anything additionally um, besides we actually, our grant was cut 25% at the beginning. So we had already cut back on what we had hoped to do, um, not in terms of participants, but in terms of um, some of the scope of the work. Uh, so it's only urine biomarkers. Um, we're not looking at micro or nanoplastics in urine. Um, we're looking at uh, phthalates, bisphenols, pHs, VOCs, um, and uh, some uh, metals. And then for our personal um, exposures to air pollution, uh, women are wearing filters for 24 hours. And there we're looking at uh, particulate matter, black carbon, pHs, um, and, uh, and that's, that's about it. So it's, it's really the only characterization of plastic that we really have is from urine, um, because pHs are so nonspecific, they could be from any source of combustion. Great. Um, there's a question in here. Do you find that many of the people in your study already understand some of the negative impacts of plastic burning? They understand the environmental impacts. Um, they, they know it smells bad, uh, so that it smells bad and it, it burns black. And so to them, that's, that's like nasty. Um, but, um, and they know it looks bad. They, they want to do something about it. Um, they just don't know what to do about it or they ha don't have the resources to do something about it. Um, and that is a continuing problem. And that's one of, I think, you know, our major concerns is sustainability, what, what can be done in the long run. Um, and um, about the health impacts, uh, just studying household air pollution for so many years, I'd say that when we ask people about the health impacts, if they're naive to a study, like looking at pneumonia, like we did in Respire, um, where we were constantly, you know, checking infants' lungs and making, you know, talking, you know, they were like, okay, it must be bad for our lungs because they're doing all these this lung testing on us. Um, but I'd say most people just say it's irritant. It makes my eyes water. It makes my nose run. It makes me cough. So they look at it as an irritant, but maybe like the chronic long-term exposures um, are not something that are there. Okay, great. Um, I just want to mention that you're getting some um, accolades here in the Q&A. People really enjoyed your talk and are also you know, wondering if it's possible to make your data more broadly available. But I'm gonna end, um, I think we just have time for one more question. And that is what, what are one or two policy changes you feel would be most effective to address this challenging issue? Well, um, I think we need to ratify the INC uh, for the, the, you know, this meeting, I think everyone should, I mean, even um, at Davos, they're talking about this. Actually, they talked about it at 1130, the World Economic Forum, um, this plastic treaty. The, the biggest thing we could do is, um, you know, ratify a plastic treaty on a global scale like we did for the Paris Accord. Um, and from there, you know, put the pressure on uh, local governments or, you know, to actually do something about it. 
Uh, but that's going to be so challenging. That would be my number one thing is, is, you know, stick to this conversation, read more about it, participate in it, understand it. Because um, even in the United States, we have so much variability. I came from California um, seven years ago. There they would say, you know, do you really want that plastic bag? Okay, we're going to charge you for it. You know, and I come here and come to Atlanta, Georgia, and they're just like stuffing things in plastic bags before I can even tell them to stop. So I think, you know, uh, once you have a policy in place that, you know, the hardest thing to do is actually, you know, enact it. Mm -hmm. and, um, did that answer your question? I think it was, was it two things or that was? Nope, that you answered it. Okay. Um, <laughs> we're, again, wonderful presentation. We're actually at time. Um, Lisa, I don't know, Lisa, my other Lisa, if you have the slide with the information for our next webinar, which will be on um, February 14th, and Victor, Dr. Victor Zhao will be joining us to talk about climate health and equity, the case for collective action from healthcare. So we hope that you can join us. Um, Dr. Thompson, I just want to thank you again, and uh, we'll be looking forward to see how your results turn out. Yes, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.